The Blair water pumps are ingenious. This one uses the pipe that delivers the water as the pump handle. In the playground of a village school, these girls are enjoying their swing pump. Official notices, pamphlets and posters are also used in an attempt to increase local awareness in endemic areas. The most desirable control measure would undoubtedly be a one-shot vaccine, and it's towards this goal that current research is mainly directed. All species of human schistosomes have essentially the same life cycle. We've chosen Mansoni for discussion here, as it's the easiest to maintain and investigate under laboratory conditions. The flukes live paired in the hepatic portal and mesenteric veins. The male is light in colour, with a dark central line, the gut, just visible. The female, partly held in his gynecophoric canal, appears very dark in comparison, because her gut is more obvious. The dark colour is haematin, a product of haemoglobin digestion, derived from red cells of the host's blood, which fills the double zigzag line of the gut. If you look closely, you'll see individual blood cells moving through the narrower passages. This female has an egg in her uterus. Above the egg is the spiralled vitiline duct. The female is cylindrical and has a relatively smooth surface. But the dorsal surface of the male bears many spiny bosses or tubercles that are thought to anchor him in position by catching against the walls of the blood vessels. There are numerous pits between the tubercles which presumably serve to increase the absorptive surface area. While sensory organelles are abundantly distributed over the entire body, these ensure that the schistosome is aware of minute changes in its microenvironment. Each fluke has two suckers at the anterior end of its body. The ventral sucker is used by the fluke to attach itself to the walls of the blood vessels. The very spiny surface of the sucker ensures a firm grip. The oral sucker is important for feeding and is used to ingest the red blood cells of the host. The orifice is spiny and its outer margin is well endowed with sense organs. In this electron micrograph, we can see two blood cells inside the oral sucker. Here, the well-anchored pair seem to be traversed by continuous peristaltic waves, which are probably associated with the rate of blood flow. Female schistosomes produce many hundreds of eggs a day, and these are deposited into a venule of the intestinal wall, where they become tightly lodged. The egg shell is covered with hundreds of needle-like spines, which abrade the tissue and enable the eggs to work their way across the bowel wall and through the villi. Here are two eggs in tissue at the bases of the intestinal villi. They're making their way towards and into the lumen of the gut. Later, they'll pass out of the body with the feces. Some eggs are inevitably swept back, past the flukes, and carried in the portal blood to the liver, where they eventually provoke an immune reaction and become encapsulated in a granuloma. These granulomas are clearly visible as white spots on the liver of an infected mouse. An egg is at the center of this mass of infiltrating leukocytes, mainly mononuclear cells and eosinophils. These cells ultimately destroy many eggs. They've already started to invade the shell of this one. In severe chronic infections, the liver becomes filled with granulomas, and this leads to portal obstruction, hypertension, ascites, and massive enlargement of the liver and spleen. Compare the size of the organs in a normal mouse and a mouse harboring a chronic schistosome infection. 
These features of pathology accurately mimic the clinical symptoms of the human disease. Schistosome eggs are easily detected in faecal smears. They're about a seventh of a millimetre long and are comparatively large as Helminth eggs go. The prominent lateral spine is the characteristic feature of Schistosoma mansoni. The spine is terminal in hematobium. And although lateral in japonicum, the spine is very small. The japonicum egg is much rounder and is therefore easily distinguished from the oval-shaped egg of mansoni. When passed in the faeces, each egg contains a fully formed myricidium, whose surface is covered with hundreds of cilia. The myricidium also possesses two pairs of flame cells, which can be recognized by their flickering movement. They form part of the simple excretory system, and their activity shows that the organism is alive. In fresh water, the egg expands by osmosis, and as its contents become diluted, the myricidium is stimulated into activity. The movements of its surface cilia set up currents in the liquid, which appears to bubble. Suddenly, the shell is fractured, and the myricidium half emerges together with fluid from the egg. But the myricidium is still contained within the vitiline membrane, which surrounded it in the egg, and it has to struggle hard for a time before it finally manages to free itself. Then, in a moment, it's on its way in search of a particular species of snail. The myricidia are propelled by vibrating the thousands of minute hair-like cilia covering their elongated bodies. This is a critical period for them. They must find their particular species of snail within a few hours, or they'll die. The snail shown here is Biomphalaria glabrata from South America. The myricidia adhere to its exposed surfaces. They burrow their way in by a combination of enzymic digestion and mechanical movement. It takes about an hour for a myricidium to penetrate completely. Once this is accomplished, the myricidium transforms to a primary sporocyst, which migrates towards the liver of the snail and begins a process of asexual multiplication. In this way, many secondary or daughter sporocysts develop independently and grow into long, thin bodies that eventually become convoluted. They give rise to cercarii that bud off in continuous sequence. Finally, the liver tissue of the snail is almost completely replaced by sporocysts and free cercarii. This is a secondary sporocyst which has been dissected out of the liver of an infected snail. It contains mature cercarii which are struggling to get out. They have developed in the sporocyst with their tails folded back along their bodies. This one is struggling very vigorously to free itself. Remember, we are watching cercarii with space around them. If they were still inside the snail, they would be tightly packed and their movements greatly restricted.